thank everyone for your patience with the tech stuff up there. Um, welcome back to this spring Wednesday seminar series with the School of Archaeology and History. Um, hope that you all had a good time off over the Christmas break. Um, so our first speaker of spring is Dr. Gemma Angel. Um, we're very, very pleased to welcome her with, into Archaeology and Ancient History. Um, so just to give a bit of background, uh, Gemma is uh, an interdisciplinary scholar uh, who, amongst other things, focuses on history and anthropology of the European tattoo, um, histories of museums and collections, object biographies, and human remains in museum contexts. Uh, prior to joining the School of Museum Studies, Gemma received a PhD from University College London in collaboration with the Science Museum and um, she was a lecturer in visual material and museum anthropology at the University of Oxford. So thank you so much for joining us Thank today. you invite, for inviting me. Yeah. It's, uh, it's great to get out of my little museum studies bubble for a while. Yeah. So uh, are you mostly archaeologists in here? Yeah? So, yeah? Okay, well I hope that, you know, so what I have to say is of some interest to you. Obviously I'm not an archaeologist. Um, I specialize mostly in the human remains I specialize in is mainly skin. So I uh, gather that you don't generally deal with a lot of that in archaeology. Um, so quick content warning. Uh, I am going to be showing some images of human remains. Um, also some photographs, uh, historical photographs that contain nudity. It's all part of the um, the narrative, so uh, just to give you fair warning about that. Um, so yeah, I, I'm going to focus a little bit on narratives um, and how we kind of construct narratives around archives and um, bodies and um, tattoos. Kind of these things kind of tend to build up in layers when you uh, work with museum objects. Um, but also historical documents as well. So I'm going to try to take you on a bit of a dual narrative journey today. So I'm going to share a little bit of my methodological process, working with material archives uh, and human remains in particular. And on the other, I'll describe how this process kind of works to help to excavate the biographies of some of the people whose remains we find in museums. Um, I'm, I guess it's, you know, that's a little bit easier from my perspective. I'm working predominantly in the 19th century. Uh, so I have a lot more archival material to go on saying that uh, not enough for my liking. Uh, it's not it's not always uh, easy. Collections tend to be a uh, 19th century collections tend to be poorly catalogued or sporadically catalogued. Um, so you have to really uh, do a lot of digging. So I like to think of researching and writing histories of collections as a kind of ethnographic process. Um, so hopefully I'll illustrate this a little bit um, and how ethnographic, uh, effective and material processes all kind of come together to inform and enrich museum and archive work in ways that wouldn't otherwise be possible. So this is uh, an example of one of the preserved tattoos um, these are historically part of the Welcome Collection in London. They are um, stored in the Science Museum now. Um, they're part of a collection of 300 preserved, dry preserved tattooed human skins that originate from 19th century France. So this is a very kind of standard Welcome Museum kind of documentation image um, of the tattoos. As you can tell looking at them, they are not um, especially for the most part uh, professionally made. Yep. Oh, sorry guys online. Let's try that again, shall we? Oh, it says it's sharing a window. Not this window, apparently. Right, let's try that again. No, no, it's totally my fault. When do I turn? Uh, was PowerPoint. Okay, well, I think it will want me to upload it. I think we can do that. 
Mm -hmm. I think we'd be used to this by now, eh? Something went wrong. Oh, no. So, sometimes it's not the place that you're not allowed to. And what you could do is just make a picture of your slide bigger, but not actually go into presentation mode. Yeah. It's not ideal. Yeah, I'm not sure how to do that. So, you just um, like just make the whole page bigger. basically do that and you're just gonna have to go through it that way. And then you share it. Oh I see. I think if you just go through it that way, it will work. Okay. It's not ideal but can people online see the slides now? You getting some indication? Yeah, okay. No, no worries. Okay, so so yeah. Um this is an example of of what the tattoos in the collection look like. They really vary in size, so from tiny little pieces that have fit in the palm of your hand to kind of entire um portions of torsos and, and things like that. So just to give you a little bit of quick background on the collection. Um in 1929, June, an itinerant English purchasing agent called Peter Johnson Saint um, met with one of his contacts in Paris, um, a man who called himself Dr. Henri Lavalette, who is a very mysterious character that I've never been able to track down. Uh, and he was finalizing this sale of a collection of 300 dry preserved tattoos. Where exactly they met um, is unclear, but they, they were, it was at an address um, on the rural college of medicine. So he was clearly involved with the medical schools around that area. It's a very sort of famous um, medical school in that part of Paris. So this is where the Université Paris Descartes, as well as the pathological collection of the Musée du Coutrin were based. Um, but this, the identity of this person remains something of a mystery. Um, but Peter Johnson Saint did record his purchasing activities for his employer, he was Henry, Sir Henry Welcome, uh, and he has this entry, which I know you can't, you can't read, this is just to illustrate just how little information <laughs> there is in the archive about, about this collection. So he typed out his, uh, his entry for, for this day, and he says, I went to see Lavalette in the Rue Ecole de Medicine. This is the man who had the collection of over 300 tattooed human skins. These skins date from the first quarter of the last century down to the present time. Many of them are very curious and extremely interesting, consisting of skins of sailors, soldiers, murderers, and criminals of all nationalities. Lavalette told me that the skins are unique, that no more could now be got under any circumstances, and that each had taken him a long time and cost him a certain amount to cure and prepare for his permanent collection. So that is the sum total of the archive information about this collection. So when uh, I got into the archive to start my PhD, very excited to see the artifacts. Uh, of course, I went to the catalogues to see what was there and realized that I'd have to approach things quite differently. <clears throat> so in the absence of any more archival documentation, how does one engage these materials and begin to excavate their biographies? The historical and spatial discontinuity, discontinuities of the museum archive require other sorts of analysis. So reading between the lines, examining material properties for traces of their past lives, interrogating the thing itself, 
which of course has been stripped of its original context. In these conditions, the context of the museum, the materiality of the artifact and the embodied experience of the researcher are foregrounded as a kind of raw material and tools with which um, we can kind of begin to make sense of these objects and reconstruct some of their histories. So this is a kind of a, a messy contingent process as, a, as you'll come to see from some of the kind of discoveries that I made along the way um, with this research with very uh, happenstance, I guess you could say, or um, serendipitous is another word that I would use. Um, but the, the point is that this con these contexts are always historically and culturally specific. Uh, they are always political and they're always embodied. So the body is always present in the archive, not just thinking about the pieces of human remains that we're analyzing, um, but we're also talking about the bodies of those who are recording, writing, collecting information, um, etc. So as I started to work with these collections, I began to realize that the researcher themselves is capable of reactivating, if you like, collections by bringing these kind of new sensibilities and sensory reflections and insights to bear on art artifacts through physical and sensory contact. So I'm going to explore that just a little bit through a few examples um, before I start to look at some of the narratives that were constructed around these tattoos in the 19th century. So I had a lot of questions to begin with when I started work on, on these tattoos, um, but none, they, I didn't have a central research question. So it was very, very open. Um, and so therefore my starting point was the material objects themselves. I was just able to sit with them and really kind of look closely, handle them and, and try to figure out what I could just on that basis. So, being that they're human remains, um, they frequently kind of provoke visceral and emotional responses um, for myself and from other people who came into contact with them. So I kind of was very aware that these materials were newly um, politicized in the archive. I started this research in about 2009. So this is not long after the introduction of the Human Tissue Act in the UK that came into force in uh, 2004. So um, a lot of museums are very, very sensitive um, about how their um, human remains in their care were being stored, cared for, handled, displayed, etc. Um, and that was a big le learning curve for me at the time. And another thing that I want to, want to kind of mention is this idea that they have a kind of agency of their own. So this slide here, um, things that talk, this is a little um, curiosity shop in Paris that I came across when I was um, doing archive work there and uh, it really <laughs> really spoke to me in uh, a way kind of that these objects do too. So the conversations that were going on around the objects and with conservators, curators, other researchers um, seem to kind of accrete in these endless layers of meaning around these things. So how did I how did I encounter them? So I, I found them to be compelling, irresistible even. They are sort of chimerical, hybrid, and I would even go so far as to say loquacious. Okay, because they've got these, you know, text phrases on. So you saw um, the, the the previous slide tattoo, Enfant du Malheur. I don't know if anyone here speaks French. <laughs> it means um, child of misfortune, which is kind of uh, sad and poignant i don't know but why you would get that tattooed on your body but um obviously he was not having a good time um when he had that tattooed or we assume so they are complicated artifacts they're simultaneously human remains icons objects of medical and criminological interest fragments of the lives of others memories made flesh grappling with the nature of this collection and how to define the specimens do we even call them specimens was the first challenge that I really had. So all of which is to say that the museum context, the archive context um, and the objects themselves were my primary starting point. So this is my workspace um, in the Science Museum uh, storage archives at Blythe House, which uh, is no more. They've moved to a different site now. 
When I first arrived at the storage archives, I spent several weeks undergoing inductions into the museum, learning its protocols, storage systems, filling out security checks, passing object handling training before I could really start to begin with them. So I had this whole new milieu within which to, which was kind of shaping my own sensibility um, in terms of how I approach these, these artifacts. So once I completed my training, I, entered, I was allowed then to enter the storage archives freely. Um, so I would go down into, into the archives through these like, two um, alarm turnstiles, uh, through these dark corridors um, to rooms that had odd smells. And I would go and I would collect the tattoos and I'd bring them up to this research search space. So it was kind of an eerie environment to be working in, which definitely primes you for a certain um, sense of haunting maybe around, around these kinds of things. So encountering my research subjects firsthand, unwrapping fragment after fragment of dried skin and analyzing them closely beneath the constant whir and rush of this portable fume hood in the lab, I started to make notes of the appearance, texture, pliability, and even the smell of each skin, producing pages and pages of notes. In many ways, it started to feel like this process was not entirely unlike doing anthropology with living people. I began, began to become really very aware that I wasn't just dealing with pieces of people's lives, but, but actual pieces of people who lived a life. So each new encounter with the tattooed skin fragments presented unexpected reflections. A new series of questions form in response to each one, and the tattooed skins themselves actually begin to suggest possible answers as I'm exploring them manually. Sometimes these questions primarily concern the tattooed individual. For instance, on unwrapping a small specimen, a little larger than the palm of my hand, I'm confronted with a large tattooed eye staring out from a tough and rather hairy fragment of skin. So an eye, a protection symbol perhaps, to ward off the evil eye. The eye stares back at me unblinkingly. The next specimen I take out of the box is almost identical, so much so that it quickly becomes apparent that these two eyes are in fact a pair, connected from one another, disconnected from one another in death, but once part of the same body. These eyes are identical in size and share strong stylistic similarities. Certainly they were executed by the same tattooer. But of course, it's the eyebrows that really give them away as a pair. So we've got a left and a right, but that's sort of point of orientation. So I begin to analyze the condition of the skin and the tattoos more closely. Um, to, and this then reveals further clues as to which part of the body they might have come from. So, and that again, will tell you something about their iconographic meaning, because of course, when you are viewing tattooed images in isolation like this without any awareness of where they fit into a larger schema, it doesn't really tell you a lot about what that tattoo meant, um, either in a kind of broader social context or to the individual who had it done in the first place. So when I'm handling these, these pair of tattoos, I find the skins to be hard, non-pliable and unusually thick. Turning them over, the reverse side reveals a textured pattern of rounded depressions, which um, you might be able to just about make out in this slide on the, uh, the right-hand side. This dimpling is caused by relatively large adipose or fat cells, which have left an impression in the connective tissue as the skin has dried, suggesting that this skin has been re removed from a very fleshy area of the body, such as the buttocks. I'm sure your, your thoughts are already going there. And you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, they're also, as you can see from this image, quite hairy. Uh, just covered with a sort of a, a layer of short curlyish hair. So I'm beginning to make sense of the, the iconographic context of this tattoo now. Um, and in fact, it kind of clicked. And I recall this old photograph taken of a pair of tattoos on a 20th century sailor's buttocks. Two large eyes staring straight ahead beneath the tattooed phrase, I see you. Suddenly the person whose skin I hold in my hands becomes three-dimensional once more, a fleshy hole. Not two little scraps of dried skin indelibly marked with crude doodles, but part of a body with geography, specificity, and a sense of humor. 
So I'm chuckling at his joke in the archive. I'm reminded of a story related by the tw early 20th century British tattooist, George Burchett in his memoirs, in which he describes an encounter at his London tattoo studio in the 1920s. Quote, a sailor breezed in, a tall strapping boy fresh from a long voyage to the Far East. He just wanted two eyes tattooed, two bright blue eyes like his own. That seemed simple enough. I told him it would not take long and mentioned the fee he would have to pay. The boy looked round, went to the couch and let down his bell bottom trousers. I want the eyes tattooed on my buttocks, one on each cheek looking straight ahead. It took me a moment to recover. Why on earth do you want two eyes glaring out of your bottom? I asked. To be able to see what's happening behind my back, he replied. Some source, you wouldn't be able to see much when you were sitting down, I told him. So obviously this is quite a, a, a humorous story. Um, there are a lot of other different kind of emotional, if you like, and effective encounters that I had like this in the archives, some which were a little bit more um, unsettling, some which were a little bit sad, um, especially when you're reading words that people have, um, like declarations that they've made and they've kind of committed to their skin for life that have outlived them. Um, but really the point is to illustrate that kind of focusing on these kind of effective moments in the archive can suggest unexpected avenues for further research. The reflections presented here illustrate some of these potential departure points. A pair of tattooed eyes may, for example, lead me to naval identity registers or to the memoirs of a professional tattooist. Thus, close observation of the materiality of the skin and the iconography of the tattoos begin to reconstruct a sense of the person. And then, you know, this is where we can begin to kind of re um, instate this, the fragment back into the kind of broader context of the life they lived. So, a second parallel strand of my material analysis focused on the um, tattooed inscriptions. So the skin was very important. So that told me a lot of things about um, how they were excised, how they were preserved, um, that, you know, what state of decomposition the body might have been in at the point where they were preserved. Um, you can kind of tell skin is very sensitive to decomposition as I'm sure you know, it's usually the first thing to go. So you um, can tell an awful lot by by what's preserved on the surface and also the marks on the back of the skin, that kind of thing. Um, but of course the tattoos themselves are the reasons why, reason why these things have been collected. And this is where I'm going to get kind of the, the richest information in terms of, you know, who were the tattooed people, like who was collecting them, why were they interested in these particular um, tattoos. So in general, the range of tattooed images, phrases, and references to geographic locations strongly suggested that the majority of the preserved tattoos likely belonged to uh, members of the Foreign Legion and other soldiers, as well as Marines and ordinary working men. Whether or not any of these individuals um, served time in military or civilian prisons is much more difficult to determine. So if you remember, Johnson Saint said that they belong to you know, murderers, criminals of all nationalities. Um, there's only one pair of tattoos that I can definitively connect to a criminal context, and it's these two. Uh, and they just happen to be the most artistically accomplished, largest pieces, really quite impressive for their time. Um, and he, this individual's story really stands out from the rest of the collection, not only because of the remarkable artistry of the tattoos, which is a rarity at this period in time, but because his biography can be traced through multiple archives historical contexts and different discourses, 19th century discourses surrounding the tattoo. So these two fragments of tattooed skin here um, were taken from the chest and abdomen of one man. Um, so you might just be able to, I don't have a pointer, but where the sort of young girl's elbow is resting is like, there's a nipple there. So that kind of, again, it kind of gives you um, a kind of, context for where in the body um, these tattoos sat. So his story uh, situates his tattooed body at the interstices of military, medical, criminological, popular culture and French political media narratives during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So it's fair to say he was like a minor 
a minor infamous <laughs> character during this period. Okay, so in December 2011, I went to Paris on my second major research trip. I'd intended to spend some time looking through numerous books and archives of photographs of tattooed criminals and soldiers stationed in North Africa, since I had by this time established that this geographical region was significant, was represented in the collection through numerous references to military, military regiments and battle souvenirs. And I was really just looking to identify iconographic similarities between motifs. I wasn't expecting to find exact matches at all. So I hadn't yet been able to make the link between criminological studies um, that they never actually mentioned tattoo preservation. So I know that they were doing it, but they were never writing about it, which was very frustrating. Um, and the, the military context, it wasn't obvious that those that they were kind of connected in the literature. So the photographic archives that I went to first were tattoo criminals, um, police archives, that kind of thing. But as you might imagine, um, these photographic archives were disordered, unlabeled, largely unprovenanced. Um, but in consulting with these disparate collections, I was really hoping to get a better sense of who was getting tattooed with what kind of images, where at the turn of the century um, in France. And I really was not prepared <laughs> to discover a familiar body amongst the parade of black and white, Burby mugshots and anthropometric police photograph tattoos. So this is the image that I found in um, the Paris police archives. And it was really a shock, uh, like recognizing the face of someone that you've known intimately, but hadn't seen for years in a crowd. Here he is almost whole. And somehow you get the sense that he's, pa he's, he's paradoxically alive, you know? And there too, at the bottom of the, the image, was his surname scrawled across the bottom of the glass for a man. So this is why um, I include the whole image because there's important documentary information there. Um, this photograph has, has been reproduced in different um, books over the 20th century, but it's always cropped to preserve his dignity. Um, and that means that that information uh, was lost. It was obviously very important data point as a researcher. So I was very excited to find this, uh, overwhelmed, shocked, all of the rest. And I began to question the curator in the archive, you know, she and she revealed there's a second photograph um, of, of his back tattoos, which I'll come back to, um, which also, you know, indicate that it's him because his name is there. But there wasn't any additional archive information about him. So I just had from Anne this surname, there was no arrest record, no mugshot, every other photograph, glass plate photograph in this archive of these tattooed criminals included their face. I still don't know what his face looks like. Uh, so for now, I had this photograph, which is July, dated July 24th, 1901. So another useful data point. Um, I know that he was still alive at this point. Um, and I can also see like far greater extent of his tattooing than could be possible from the preserved um, skins at all. So these, Fromand's tattoos are among the largest preservations in the collection and they're certainly um, the, the, the best artistically rendered. And they are made with hand needles and this would have been quite challenging um, at this point. Moreover, the iconography employed is absolutely distinctive, which makes them highly unusual when compared to other tattoos in the collection uh, and with tattooing more generally during this period. So it's perhaps surprising then that his tattoos in particular became a subject of a lot of criminological speculation. So when I was going to those text sources, the criminologists were very interested in tattoos and their signification and what they said about the psychology of the criminal during this period. Okay, so here we go. Interpretations of the meanings of Fromand's tattoos were offered in a number of texts that I came across. So um, a cropped version of the photograph appeared in um, a book of criminals titled Le Tatouage du Milieu. In this book, Fromand is unidentifiable by name 
um, the authors provide no contextual information. So there is just one line caption beneath the image, which reads, while the first of his lovers rests on his breast, truly and forever, the second took a more passionate, intimate place. So <laughs> there's several problems with this interpretation, as I'm sure you're picking up on already. Um, so the person who compiled this kind of book, it's like an early coffee table book, really, um, for people who were interested in tattoos and criminology, I guess. Uh, he was the pol police superintendent of the Surat Nationale in Paris. His name is Jack Delarue. And he is really making this extraordinary assumption that both of the female figures that are tattooed are over from man's body were his lovers. Um, and it also, it's clear from the description that he's interpreted the, speci the specificity of the location of the tattoos um, with their, uh, their meaning and what they meant to, to that person, who, to, to Framan himself. So the figure on the chest placed literally and figuratively close to the heart is read as his, as his true love, whilst the woman depicted in a kind of domestic cafe scene on his abdomen is construed as his mistress based entirely upon the proximity to his genitals, it seems. However, <laughs> on closer scrutiny of the proportions of the body and the face of the female figure tattooed on his chest, it appears to be the portrait of a child rather than an adult woman. So initially I thought, well, perhaps this is a, you know, a portrait of his child or you know, somebody close to him. Um, until that is, I was watching TV um, one evening, BBC Four, Hidden Dangers of the Victorian Home. There was an episode on um, infant, infant milk, um, formula milk, and it was all about how you know that you couldn't clean the bottles out properly and they were dangerous, etc. But they showed kind of brief images of lots of different um, copy advertising from the period, and this image flashed up for I don't know, three and a half seconds. <laughs> I leapt out of my chair like shouting, "It's her!" and immediately went to you know, find out what this image was, what this advertisement was. And I think you can, you can see quite clearly, it's not just um, a similar image, it's an exact replica, you know, that she's leaning on the urn. Of course, you know, the, the sort of shrinkage and drying of the skin has distorted the features a little bit, um, but, you know, even the folds in the dress, it's, it's absolutely a copy of this image. So yes, this is Ridge's patent cooked food, infant formula milk, published in the British illustrated newspaper weekly, The Sketch in uh, 1893. Which, so that the British connection is kind of interesting there too. So the revelation that the tattooed man photographed in Delarue's book, in fact, had no personal connection to the child whose likeness he bore on his chest, complicates the reading of his tattoos based simply on the geography of the body. While his tattoos definitely possess an air of uh, sentimentality, it's possible that the child's portrait was nothing more than an appealing image drawn from popular culture. You know, it's no different than, than the reasons why people get tattoos today. And in fact, it might not have even been the choice of the tattooed man himself. It's entirely conceivable that a skilled tattooist eager to display their talents selected this image, which would be all the more impressive executed in skin. So if you think of it a little bit like street artists that you see in Leicester Square, they always have uh, portraits of celebrities displayed because they're familiar faces that everybody knows. You can walk past and you recognize them and you can tell if it's an accurate likeness or not immediately. So this could have been a similar um, technique for acquiring new clients. So the interpretation of Framan's tattoos offered by Delarue and many other criminologists in this period is often based on this uncritical reading of the spatial topography of the body, which conflates the surface representation with emotional and visceral interiority. So in, in the case of Framan's tattoos, representing the proximity to the heart and, and the genitals. This follows a kind of a pattern of reading the body in 19th century criminological text that encourages thematic connection of distinct elements and facilitates their incorporation into a sort of more coherent narrative whole that might not in fact be there. So the pattern links images in the same way 
Um, one follows text on a page proceeding from left to right, top to bottom. And it's a very typical Western Latin reading configuration. And it's really revealed in Delarue's comment as well, because he's talking about, you know, the first of his lovers appears on his chest, the second, you know, lower down on the body. There's no way to know which tattoo he had done first. It's a, you know, th that's a totally unfounded assumption. So, <clears throat> Having considered some of the criminological narratives and interpretations of 19th century tattoos, I'm going to just briefly now um, look at some of the more popular literary and media narratives of the time. So perhaps one of the best known is Roald Dahl's short story entitled Skin. Um, does anybody know this one? No? Oh, it's great. You love it. So this was published in 1952. Uh, and it's a macabre little tale that tells the story of an old tattooist named Dreely who has a magnificent work of art tattooed on his back by the famous painter Sham Soutin. One day, he happens upon an exhibition of the dead artist's work in a fancy Paris gallery, and recalling the tattoo on his back, he decides to go inside and take a closer look. Having fallen on hard times, now reduced to begging for a living, he's not welcome amongst the wealthy art patrons until he reveals the original artwork permanently inked into his skin. The gallery owner immediately offers him a large sum of money for the tattoo. But how, Dreely asks, can I possibly sell it? After some discussion, he has made an offer by one of the art collectors to perform as a living picture gallery at his hotel, where he will be able to live a life of luxury in return. Dreely accepts, and a few weeks later, a nicely framed and heavily varnished picture by Soutine, matching the description of Dreely's tattoo, turns up at an auction house in Buenos Aires. So whilst Dahl's tale is on the face of it a work of darkly comic fiction, Having studied the collection and preservation of tattooed human skin for many years now, I feel certain that Roald Dahl must have drawn inspiration from personal experience of uh, hearing about such collections in Paris at the turn of the century. So um, this is another incident where Froman pops up and we see his tattoos, but we don't see his face. Uh, the sketch that you see here uh, on the cover of this uh, French um, popular political journal, Le Journal Illustré, uh, in August 1897, could be mistaken for an illustration of a scene from Dahl's short story. Though the gawping onlookers here are military officers and physicians rather than art patrons. But this image predates the publications of a skin by more than 60 years. In fact, the magnificent work of art crudely sketched onto the tattooed man's back, and for this era of amateur tattooers, it, it was quite magnificent depicts one of the greatest military and political scandals to rock France during the 19th century, the Dreyfus Affair. While one might assume that the cartoon is merely a work of political satire, the tattooed Dreyfus Affair, as it was known in the press, was very real. And not only was the soldier who wore this elaborate tattoo literally offered 400 francs for the skin off his back, some of his tattoos did eventually find their way into a museum collection post-mortem. So I was, of course, interested in covering more information about this image and the story that accompanied it, especially since the man described in the news report was named August Foreman. So this is where we get into the 19th century era of misspellings and multiple spellings of, of the same name. Um, I thought this, it has to be, it has to be this person. So. In a medical report dated 1897, doctors Genestis and Bestion described in detail the extensive tattoos of an unnamed soldier who had been admitted to the San Nicolas Military Hospital in Bordeaux for the treatment of typhoid fever. The report chronicles, sorry, the report coincides with the date of uh, this sketch um, by Oswaldo Tasfani that appeared in the newspaper and depicts a man named in the press as August Foreman standing topless in what appears to be a hospital ward with his back to the viewer and surrounded by medics, military officers and gentlemen. Although only his back tattoos are clearly visible in the sketch, I was able to make visual comparisons between the 1901 photograph of Foreman and the inventory of tattoos in the medical report in order to positively identify Foreman as the tattoo pa patient. So I thereby also finally got his first name. So here we go. 
<clears throat> so in this article, the anterior aspect of the body is described first, followed by the back, describes 30 di distinct tattoos, not all of which you can see from the photograph. So um, just to point out a few, a chain with oval links extending from one clavicle to another through the fork of the sternum, um, from the intrascapular region to the lower part of the lumbar region, so we're talking about his back, an immense tattoo representing the punishment of the traitor Dreyfus. The it is the reproduction of an engraving published in Journal Illustré, etc., um, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So it's you can see that this is a this is a kind of a positive identification matching the photograph to this medical medical article. So this doc document goes on in a lot of detail to list Framan's tattoos, including numerous individual designs and hands, legs, posterior surface of his arms that can't be seen. Um, what is perhaps most interesting, though, from my perspective, is the trace of Fromand's own testimony regarding the origin and significance of his tattoos. Um, as I've, I've speculated, almost all of the larger, more distinctive tattoos were made by the same tattooer, a fellow soldier in the bat staff. Whilst numerous other small tattoos on the legs he made himself, um, the four largest ones described by Fromand as having been drawn after engravings. So this includes the back tattoo and, of course, the abdominal scene, apparently, I haven't managed to match that to an image yet, but that was taken from a, a, a popular um, print image and also the, the female portrait on his chest. Okay. So the discovery of Fromand's back piece in the French political presses opens up a whole new narrative possibilities, um, not least in considering the significance of this image within the broader context of fin de cycle French politics and popular culture. So Fromand's back tattoos were the subject of intense public scrutiny, variously described as patriotic by anti-Semitic and conservative commentators, and as a skin museum that was deserving of preservation as a spectacular visual, visual chronicle of recent political events. One press report describes how during his appearance before the 8th Correctional Chamber on the 10th of July, 1901, Framan's lawyer, himself described um, as tattooed in La Matan, is reported to have told the court that upon his release, Framan will go to America where several sideshows are competing for his, um, his, his time as a, as a public exhibition. <laughs> The same article mentions his by now quite infamous back tattoo, which depicted scenes from the Dreyfus affair and speculates whether this artwork will find its way into American hands. Um, so at this point, Framan is diagnosed as suffering with alcoholism and aggressive mania, and he ends up being sent to um, Salpetriere Hospital. Um, so he then enters the asylum, which is another common context in which um, people's tattoos, tattooed bodies were scrutinized during this period. Um, so, just for visual reference, you, it's kind of difficult to see on this screen, but this is the um, original engraving of the degradation of Dreyfus that appeared in Le Journal Illustré, and you can just make out the very sort of crude line drawing in the, the second engraving um, that you can see that the image matches. There we go. So this is the photograph of his back. So this, um, when this new historical press material came to my attention, I returned to my archives and looked for this photograph. So I, I knew it was there, but because this tattoo was not preserved in the welcome collection, it was just kind of sitting there languishing in my, in my archives. Um, so again, you can, I think you can see a bit more clearly in this one that it reproduces the like, key elements of the image quite faithfully. Um, interestingly, and I don't know what to make of this, the scales of justice are missing from um, the figure of justice up there, but that's you know open to interpretation. It'd be interesting to know what you think about that. Um, so for those of you who don't know anything about um, the degradation of Dreyfus and the Dreyfus affair, um, what is actually happening here? So we have this avenging figure of France um, clutching the upraised sword and scales of military justice. She's stripping the military garb from Dreyfus's back 
and he's being banished to um, the penal colony of Devil's Island before a crowd of military onlookers. And this kind of, um, it's an allegory, but it was an event that actually took place. Um, it was a very ritualized uh, stripping of his um, military rank and insignia and breaking his sword uh, in public. Um, and it's, you know, he's very anti-Semitic as well. We've got this like plaque being held up here that says Judas. So he was basically framed for allegedly selling um, French military secrets to the Germans. Um, it turned out it was actually somebody, one of the officers much, much higher up than him and he was just the scapegoat. So huge scandal, huge scandal at the time. <clears throat> but also interesting that someone would have something like this tattooed on their back, yes? So we have these like three separate archival data points that kind of speak to these complex and intersecting narratives and different um, parts of, of, of French social and political life that tell a very different story to um, the criminological and the medical um, texts about tattoos at this time. So from the various narratives, archive documents and photographs presented here, you can begin to glimpse the various contexts in which Fromand's tattoos were um, kind of employed really um, for, for different ends to create meaning, appearing in both popular milieu as a source of spectacle in the press from which he seems to actively um, sought to exploit um, in perhaps his intention of becoming a tattooed man, um, as well as multiple institutional context. His tattoos are described at length by doctors in the military hospital, photographed and discussed by criminologists in journals and articles, and eventually excised and preserved post-mortem, tracing his journey through the military, the prison, the courtroom, the asylum, and the public arena. What is so compelling about Fromand's case, however, is that although his tattoos appear in every significant 19th century context engaged in the study of the tattoo, the character and specificity of his tattoos disrupt and defy the discourses that sought to define and make legible uh, what was considered a highly problematic um, thing at this time. So tattoo, tattooing amongst um, sort of ordinary classes of Europeans was considered by the middle classes to be a sign of um, social and moral uh, degeneration. So in the, 19th, uh, so the 1897 article that outlined his tattoos, the author muses on the oft cited 19th century correlation between the extent of Fermat's tattooing and his evident latent criminality. Quote, is this a sign of crime as Lombroso claims? If we admit the conclusions of this author, the precocity of the tattoos that we find in our subject, the number and multiplicity of these tattoos would make our subject a born criminal. And we could explain how from the first quarter hour of his incorporation into the military, he had to be imprisoned for insulting a superior and his bad conduct has never ceased since. However, he is forced to concede that it is rare to meet patients as completely and as artistically tattooed. I've consulted the collection of Lombroso and I have not found similar ones. The tattooed skin preserved in the Museum of the Faculty of Medicine of Bordeaux could not either be compared to the tattoos of our subject. If they are numerous, indeed, they have no artistic character. So these biological fragments of Auguste Fromand's life are thus made legible only through these sort of traces and narratives surrounding his tattooed body as he came within the purview of institutionalized disciplinary power. It's, from, it's clear from these materials that the 19th century tattoo was remarkable for its apparent ability to speak to multiple audiences, generating endless speculative interpretations. So much so that not only were tattoos traced, redrawn and photographed, but they were also excised post-mortem and preserved as museum special, special specimens. They continue to speak to contemporary audiences in many surprising ways. So I'm gonna leave you with this quote from Lorraine Dastin. Things that talk are often chimeras, composites of different species. The difference in species must be stressed. The composites in question don't just weld together different elements of the same kind. They straddle boundaries between kinds. Art and nature, persons and things, objective and subjective are somehow brought together in these things. And the fusions result in considerable blurring of outlines. So I think 
ink and skin, human remains and preserved specimen, museum object, trace of sub subjective memory. All of these descriptions cohere around and within the welcome collection tattooed skins. One could hardly imagine a better example of the kind of chimerical thing of which Dustin writes. But if they speak, what are they saying to us? Can we answer this question? <laughs> I've tried to some extent, um, but of course it it's, remains open. Um, and I'd like to open it up to you to, to share your insights and, and ask me any questions that you might have. Thank you. So um, I think we've probably got time for like one or two questions. Sure. We've Sorry if I've overrun no, there. We, we, we caused a delay with with um, <laughs> I caused a delay with my setup at the start, and so apologies for that. I think that someone has got the room booked for six o'clock. So okay. if we've you know got some time for for some questions, yeah. if there's anyone in the room Shoot. or online, or online yeah. even presenting in the chat box. Um. Hi, Brian. Uh, Hi. Question about how these like how these came together as a collection of sort of tattoos. Like, what was the process? Was it post mortem? Of course, was the body already taken, or was it sort of taken later, dug up, or something? What was the time period the scale sort of thing? So that's it's a really great question. It's quite difficult to answer. Um, and again, the. The archive information, or at least what Lavalette had to say, that he collected them all himself, prepared them all himself according to this, you know, unique method. You can tell from looking at the skins, um, the quality of the preservation, the fact that they've been dry preserved with different types of chemicals, that actually these have been put together by lots and lots of different people. Um, and some are very, very skilled. So you, um, for example, Oh, I think I've closed it down now, but there was uh, an image. <clears throat> this is why we want the computer to be a bit quick. Um, so one of my one of my favorite tattoos is like a tiny little, um, almost like a parchment. And it has this text text on it. it. It fits in the palm of your hand and it's like a little love letter. Um, but this one is a really great example of um, a skilled preservation. It's extremely thin. Um, the edges have been nicely trimmed, unlike most of the rest of them. It's very, very different in character um, to something like this, which is warped. So I, what I think was, that was happening at the time is that um, people who was kind of ordinary um, military doctors, prison doctors were aware of this kind of academic criminological interest in the tattoo. And when the, they had the opportunity within these institutions to actually collect the tattoos when their patients or inmates died and they were, they were collecting them and, and sending them to people like Alexandra Lacassonia, who was like the big guy who was interested in these things at the time. So I actually think that they've been gathered over a long period of time. Um, the, the condition of the tattoos and the variation preservation would certainly indicate that. Yeah. One over here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You get lots of the same kind of phrases, um, which suggests that they have come from particular regiments and groups of people stationed in particular places. Um, but the, yeah, the only two other than the eyes that I've been able to say, okay, these were like the, you know, archived separately in the museum, but they're part of the same body was, is from Anne's big kind of um, chess piece because you, if it was just the upper part of the chest, you'd never know, but because it preserves the abdomen as well, and there's that kind of scene um, that's cut in half, that uh, makes it quite apparent. But yeah, I, it's hard to know, like it could be, it could, could be 300 people in that collection, or there could be 
a hundred, you know, someone who had lots of little tattoos removed separately, it's without destructive testing, I think it'd be impossible to know. Well, you can ask, you can ask me anyway as I'm logging out. Thank you, people online. You can always email me a question. Thank you so much. Shall I leave? Bye, bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>